In the book and story of Joshua, remember Joshua was the protege of Moses. He, he was the one that took over for Moses after Mo God took Moses. In the story of Joshua, we hear or, or see the continuation of God moving in Israel's life to put them into the promised land. And in the later chapters of Joshua, Joshua is about to come to the end of his life. And he knows that and he calls all of Israel together to chat with them a little bit and actually reinitiate or remind them of the covenant that they had made with the Lord many years earlier. And over and over, he recounts in Joshua 24, the things that God had done for them, all the way inclusive of the different nations that he drove out before them, starting with Jericho. If you recall, recall the story of Jericho, what did they do to, to win that victory? The walls were high and thick. And God tells them, all you need to do is go into the city and walk around the walls once a day, silent, for seven days. On the seventh day, do it seven times. And at the end of those seven times, scream, blow trumpets, and God made the walls fall down. And then they won the battle. So he reminds them of that, but then he reminds them of this in Joshua 24. And I'll pick up in verse 13. And it reads, I gave you a land on which you had not labored and cities that you had not built and you dwell in them. You eat the fruit of vineyards and olive orchards that you did not plant. Now, therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and faithfulness. Put away the gods that your fathers served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. Hmm. Clearly, if you read through the first six books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and Joshua, you will see over and over how God clearly works for his people. He fights their battles. He protects them. He feeds them. He guides them. Night and day, he's in the midst of them. Hmm. He clearly reveals this in his power. You remember the story, for example, of Moses, when God brings him to Mount Sinai and the smoke comes down on the mountain and there's thunder and flashes of lightning and the people are terrified, terrified. And they beg Moses, you go talk to God. We don't want to talk to God. But how quickly they just abandon all the things that they just saw God do when Moses tarries for 40 days. They go to Aaron and say, make us a God that we can worship it. Remember the golden calf. 40 days and they just forgot everything that God had done. And before, before you say, hey, I know those Israelites, <laughs> we do the same thing. We can go to church one day and hear a message that's super convicting. And then we leave and forget all about it and go to work the next day. Brothers and sisters, we need to cling to God. We need to hold on to God for our dear lives. Let's drop down to the New Testament where Paul picks up the same kind of idea that everything we have, God gave us. In 1 Corinthians 4, starting in verse 7b, we read, What do you have that you did not receive? If then you received it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it. Hmm. In other words, if you receive something from someone, you can't sit there and say you earned it or, or you created it or you did it. But what did we receive? Maybe, that, maybe that's what we need to define. I mean, maybe, maybe we're thinking, you know, I put in all the hours for the homework. I went to school. I did all the study. I built this business from the ground up. Blood, sweat, and tears. And I'm going to tell you everything you have, including your wisdom, your academic accolades, that business of yours, the car, the house, even your kids are gifts from God. They're blessings from God. They came about because of God. Let's hear that from Luke in the book of Acts. We read the God, verse 24, the God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, 
nor does nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything and he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way towards him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being. Brothers and sisters, we cannot forget we cannot forget that every single thing we have, even when it seems bad, comes from God. Think of Job. Think of just the story of Job. God put Job through what he put him through. And if you read through the details of what happened to Job, God put him through all of that. Yet God was with him the whole time. Even the nation of Israel, God put them through all of that. And every time a plague came, they, they endured more hardship, if you recall. More hardship. Yet it was for their good. And ultimately, they made it to the promised land. And that is our hope. The true promised land. Heavenly promised land. Where there's a new heaven and earth. Where there's no more tears or fa uh, fear or pain or, or sickness or death. I want to encourage you, brothers and sisters, the same way Joshua encouraged the nation of Israel. Now, therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and faithfulness. Be blessed.